welcome to Reading Aloud, the programme about books that's more than just a review show. It's all about sharing books that you're passionate about using in schools. Now, these exam crammers may not excite much passion, but in today's programme, one top author launches a blistering attack on testing. The thing about these exams is they don't just crucify the children, they crucify the teachers. Also in this week's show, pupils play pitching to the publisher, I do my Russell Crowe impression. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. And the public prove why we need Bill Bryson's Guide to Science. Do you know what a proton is? What's a proton? Yeah. But first, an author with a fascinating range of material and interests, Robert Swindells. He's not afraid to tackle controversial issues like nuclear disarmament and homelessness, but he's also responsible for chilling and magical adventure stories, like Ice Palace. The hero, Ivan, lives in a land where the winter is dark and fearful. Stargic, king of winter, steals Ivan's little brother, and Ivan braves the bitter cold and packs of wolves to find the little boy. And somewhere back there, he knew the wolves were running in his tracks. He must find a tree to climb. Wolves can outrun any living thing, but they cannot climb trees. He stumbled on, looking wildly around him. But the trees just here were pines with smooth icy trunks. The wolf cries drew nearer. He plunged forwards, gasping. They had seen him now. A few seconds more, and they will be upon him. Ivan's adventures in Ice Palace have really captured the imagination of the children at Lee Gomery Junior School in Shropshire. They've all read the book, but teacher Merle Traves wants to know how they would promote it. What, what is it that's so special about this book that I should spend the money to publish it? It's really exciting and thrilling and every child in the world would want to buy it. Really, the focus was children's writing. I wanted to improve their writing instead of the sort of story that started. This happened, this happened, and there was the end. I wanted them to think really carefully about the type of language they were using in that opening sequence. Were you asking the children to guess what might come next as you were reading along? That's right. I waited till the first in incident that happens because what takes place is got he's got a number of obstacles. The main character is going to get his brother back. And in order to do that, he has to overcome a number of obstacles. So after the first obstacle, I wanted him to predict what was going to happen next. And there was some really good thinking coming from the children. As Ivan was walking, he felt the ground start to shake. He did not know what was happening and felt scared. He was alone in the woods with the ground shaking. And as he turned, he saw a blinding light and a crack in the ground started to open until it was as big as a lake. It's so cold that the trees shiver. Because it's magical, it's like a dream come true. The snow looks soft and fluffy. Uh, if they weren't committed to the story as a story, it wouldn't work. Yeah. But yet, at the same time, you were able to say, listen to this. How does he describe it? And you've got really good examples yeah. of uh, the description in the book. Oh, I love that phrase you use, committed to the story. Yes, I mean, in the sense that they wanted to know what happens at the end. And it pulls, what works really well is that it pulls the class together. There's that shared, lovely shared experience that they have. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North, General of the Felix Legion, loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Russell Crowe, eat your heart out. Well, the man who penned those famous lines from Gladiator is the Oscar-nominated writer William Nicholson. The screenplay has brought Nicholson fame, but he's also an award-winning, best-selling children's writer specialising in fantasy. What I'm doing now is I'm writing fantasy novels. Um, I've got a new novel out called Seeker. What I'm trying to do in Seeker is to do... It's very ambitious, this. It's three books, and 
I'm taking three teenagers and I'm putting them through enormous changing experiences as they pursue what to them is the most valuable thing they can do, which is serve their God. Now, I have to tell you, their God is going to turn out not to be what you expect. Nothing is simple in these books. But what I promise you is, this is me trying to say everything that you need to learn for life, these characters are going to learn in front of your eyes, including, by the way, how to have superpowers. In Seeker, there's a pirate called the Wild Man. Now, the Wild Man looks rather like me, except you've got to imagine me with long, blonde curls, OK? And my arms are bare and tanned, and I've got these uh, silver bangles all down it, and I've got bright-coloured clothes, and I am a river pirate. And I come in my boat with my team of pirates, and all I want to do is rob and kill. So I come into a village of terrified villagers, and I'm the Wild Man, and the first thing I say is, hey ya Do you love me? Because the Wild Man loves to be loved. And if you don't love him, he cuts your throat. Something very interesting happens when you um, write a story. You think what you're doing is writing a story that's just fun, and all you're interested in is the plot and how it develops and uh, making your characters be fun. Actually, what's happening when you write is everything you most believe starts to come out, and you don't even know it's happening. But a, the, the act of storytelling is also the creation of values, the, the communication of values. Values that in Seeker involve a quest for power. And he doesn't even touch him, and the Wildman flies, flies away. He's completely knocked over. So the Wildman gets up and he thinks, this is real power. I want some of this. When I started writing my first children's novel, it's called The Windsinger, um, I said to myself, if anybody's going to want to read this, it's got to have some strong emotion driving it. And what do I really feel strongly about? And up popped the idea, exams. I've got three children and they were just beginning to get into this mad testing thing where everything gets tested the whole time and they get measured and the schools get measured and it just drove me crazy. So I thought, I'm going to write a novel which smashes the whole idea of exams. The thing about these exams is they don't just crucify the children, they crucify the teachers because they force the teachers to go down these very narrow rails. And I know teachers hate this. Many of them have told it to me. I'd hate it if I was a teacher. What I want from a teacher who's teaching my child is for that individual to pass on the passions and the enthusiasms and the knowledge and the wisdom of that individual, whatever that happens to be. I mean, what, what else is worth passing on? And I, I, it just makes me weep when I see that they say, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question, they say to a child. It's not part of the syllabus. We must stick to the syllabus. I mean, that's not education. William Nicholson sounding off about exams there, and I tend to agree with him. I've sat a good few exam papers in my time and had my scary moments. And the things that nervous candidates come up with can be quite surprising. The first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers and Laxatives. The First World War was caused by the assignation of the arch duck by a serf and ushered in a new era in the annals of human history. In one of Shakespeare's famous plays, Hamlet relieves himself in a long soliloquy. William Tell shot an arrow through an apple while standing on his son's head. And my all-time favourite, Sir Francis Drake circumcised the world with a hundred-foot clipper. How much do we know about the world around us? Travel writer Bill Bryson woke up one morning and asked himself that very question and realised that in his case, wasn't very much, or as he put it, he didn't know a quark from a quasar, a proton from a protein, and he had no idea how an atom is put together. So he spent three years attempting to answer these conundrums, and the result, a brilliantly funny, best-selling book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. In a moment, I'll be putting it to our panel. But do we really know our protons from our proteins? Do you know what a proton is? What's a proton? No. Car? No. no. It's a fast food. <laughs> what is? A proton. Part of the cell, is it? Something to do with atoms? Yeah, the proton's Shells. a bit in the middle, isn't it? Do you know what protein is? Protein. That's coffee, <laughs> drink, man. It helps build muscles. A vitamin that you need? Which is good for the body. Ah, right. Never heard of a quark? You can make cheesecake yeah. with it. A quark. It's a little, little word we find in the uh, wheat uh, fields. All right, what is it, like a rodent? That's right. It's not some kind of fat, is it? Or is it a unit of measurement? Quark's a building block of a, 
and atom is it build block of protons, electrons and neutrons? He's it a bit flash, isn't he? Is, Well, plenty of interpretations of the word quark there. Now, is this book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, is this going to help them, Julia? Probably, but um, I can't remember finding out about quarks. What you would find out is who discovered the quark, who found the quark, how are they related to other people who knew about quarks. All of that would be in this, because this is really more about the people than about the scientific thing. You'd also have to be able to remember the detail, and there's a hell of a lot of detail in this book. Too much detail, Gally? Uh, yes. Uh... To, the, to an extent, it's like um, going maybe four rounds with Mike Tyson, but instead of having your brain cells knocked out, it's like having a lot crammed in, as it were. At the end of it, I mean, you still wake up, you know, kind of face flat on your canvas. It's a lot to take <laughs> in. Um, but having said that, it's, it's very informative. It's a lively style, isn't it, Stacey? I mean, he's, he's telling many stories and knitting in a few gags on the way. Does that, is that just making science palatable? Is it a way of sugaring the pill, if you like? Well, I think that's what he's trying to do, um, and in a way it sort of works, but ultimately it is still a book about science, and at the end of it, if that isn't your particular interest, I think and you're I'm left at the end of it. I'm suspecting it may not be yours. No, it isn't, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. um, I mean, I did appreciate the literary style, and, the, and there are a lot of techniques that he's trying to use to liven it up and make it interesting for the reader, but I'm afraid for me it just didn't work. Aren't I... you excited now that you know how important carbon is? Well, no, because I've got through my life so far without me. Ah, no, I, I don't. I could. I think I am excited. I'm excited by his excitement with science. Amazing stuff, like about um, the the Curies. Not nobody realizing how dangerous everything that they were working on was, and that Marie Curie's papers now have to be kept in a lead box mm. because they are so incredibly impregnated with. Um, plutonium. I mean, it's things like that that were absolutely fascinating about it. I mean, you do come away knowing a lot. You come away knowing about how, fo you know, how people understood about fossils and all of that. But the science is hard to remember. It's more the stories about the science. The problem with the book is that it's not the Oxford Illustrated Guide to the Science, and it's not what a scientist would pick up and use as a manual. If I walked into a book without any knowledge, say as a 13-year-old, if I walked into that book and started hearing about um, protons being, you know, 10 to the minus 9 or whatever the figure is, I would just put the book straight back down because I don't think I could comprehend that. So I think you just need to have a little bit of background before, yeah. you, bit of context, yeah, before you pick it up. I don't think this is a short history of nearly everything. I think this is a short history of the, the ideas and the people in science. Mm. Any implications for the teaching of science? I think that it would be a really useful teaching tool in, in science classrooms. Um, and obviously it would create cross-curricular links as well because of the way that it's written. But I think it would be um, an interesting way for them to approach it. I don't know how the science teachers would feel about that. I'm going to be positive and say, well, there's something in here for everyone, but it just might be very different uh, particles. <laughs> <laughs> Time to say goodbye, but uh, before I go, have you got any idea where that word quark comes from? Bill Bryson's got the story. He says to start off with, they wanted to call them partons, as in dolly. But in the end, they went for quarks, which they took from a line in Finnegan's Wake. Three quarks for Muster Mark. Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. You see, it all comes back to books, doesn't it? Bye.